Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's the top of the hour, so um, people are still joining. So we'll just gently start with today's proceedings. Um, hello, everyone. My name's Sean Fury, and I'm the director of the RWN, RWN Secretariat. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this Leave No One Behind theme webinar on the uh, topic of incontinence uh, and urgent uh, hidden issue for rural water supply. Um, before we get going, I will just run us through a few housekeeping things to just make sure that everyone has a, a good experience today. So this webinar will be recorded and the recordings and presentations will be shared afterwards. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the uh, slides are I believe already up on the RWSN website. So if you want to, you can always go there and download them and follow them in your own time. Um, please do introduce yourself in the in the chat box um, with your name, organization, and country. Uh, during uh, this webinar, there will be an opportunity to post uh, some questions and, and answers. Uh, so please use the Q&A box for that. Uh, but otherwise, please um, share your comments in the chat box. And then at the end, there'll be a short survey at the end of the webinar, which is really useful for us uh, to uh, hear your feedback. How how we're doing? Was it a good webinar? What can we do better for next time? Uh, and so forth. So today's agenda, uh, I'm uh, uh, just doing the welcoming now. And then I will hand over uh, to my colleague Euphrasia, who will do us a short poll, and then we'll have uh, an opening remarks by Dr. Amita uh, Bakta, one of the uh, Leave No One Behind um, theme co-leads. And then we've got three fantastic presentations that have been uh, prepared for us uh, from from the, the Asia and the Pacific, which is great because those of you who um, follow our WSN a lot, a lot, we do a lot on Sub-Saharan Africa, which is great, but it's really nice to have diverse perspectives from around the world. And we're going to be hearing some, from some new parts of the world that we don't often hear from in, in our WSN. So this is this is really great and some great partnerships that we're, we're that we're developing in the in the region. Then we've got a time for a uh, di discussion with the Dr. F uh, uh, Tina Vatinen um, from Tampere University. And then we'll have the question and answer session and then closing remarks. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Euphrasia Lusaka in Kenya, who will take us through the poll. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sean. My name is Yefrisa Luseka. I'm a Water Governance and System Strengthening Specialist, and I'm also part of the Leave No One Behind team under the RWSN uh, network. So today I want to take you through um, a very short poll because we're intending to have a very engaging session. And we also hope that you're already starting to uh, give us your input, your views of the webinar itself. And even when you move into the presentations, we're really hoping that you can continue giving us uh, more questions and views to the call, to, to the presentations that are going to be coming uh, through. So uh, as you can see on the screen, we have a short poll that you can be able to engage in through the link that has been provided. And the questions are only four and quite interesting as well. So I encourage you to get on board. Um, the first one is on, have you been to the toilet today? The second one is asking the last time you went to the toilet, did you have a poo? The third one, have you ever not made it to the toilet in time? And the fourth one, did some of these questions make you feel uncomfortable? We'd like to hear from you. Honest reviews only. In a minute or so, we're going to be seeing the results popping up, courtesy of my colleague, Aline. I hope you can be able to see the link uh, down on the slide.
Mm -hmm. Aline, probably you could be able to share with us the results. Ninety percent apparently have been to the toilet today. Eight percent are saying no on that. Let me see if the results are going to shift. Mm -hmm. On the second one, we can be able to see that apparently 54% of people did go to the toilet and did have a pool. 6% are not willing to see. It's quite interesting to also be able to see how issues to do with um, stigma, issues to do with uh, discrimination, humiliation comes in in such discussions. Probably maybe that is why people are not preferring to talk about a few things. On the third question, we can see uh, that apparently 66% of people have not made it to the toilet in time. 32% have, wow, these are such lucky people. Uh, on the fourth one, we can see, did some of these uh, questions make you to feel uncomfortable? Actually, 62% are saying no, they didn't. 6% still say they felt a little bit uncomfortable answering a few. And we're going to also see how, probably why you are feeling that way. And we also hope that you can be able to share with us your views of the chat box on the same. As we move to the next session, I want to appreciate your input on this poll. And I want to invite my colleague, Dr. Amita to take it over from here. Thank you, uh, Amita. Welcome for the opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning, good morning, good evening, and welcome to this. Good morning, good evening, good morning, good evening. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we mean by content and what the topic being discussed today. So, incontinence is not as important as after viewing an OPC or the making of viewing an OPC. It is a good way of science, but very well it's known about it in the Lincoln countries. Although a lot of research has been done on incontinence in high income countries. Um, because you do not think this that's very spoken about even by medical professionals because it is very stigmatized. People with physical diseases, people with disabilities, are often hidden from you, either by personal choice or by their family. It is not one of the issues, and it's actually very difficult to get onto what it is. This is because it's often seen as a symptom rather than a disease. It affects few people in community. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Amita, for those great uh, welcome remarks. At the same time, I can see have been able to set the scene for people who probably are not aware of what uh, incontinence is all about. And it's also the, the nexus itself with uh, rural water uh, supply uh, issues. So thank you a lot for the same. And sometimes uh, we are also seeing a lot of... Um, a, 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 a lot of perception, misconceptions actually around incontinence. People usually assume that it's only about the women, but also the men are also facing the same issue 
when they come of age. Now, um, Amita also has various publications on this topic. I believe she's going to be sharing some on the chat box uh, that you can be able to pick up. I would like to go straight into our next uh, session, and that is on the presentations to listen to our amazing speakers on their key um, inputs uh, around the topic. And I hope also at this moment, you can be able to share with us any of your views as well as questions on the chat box. Thank you very much and welcome Dr. Danny Barrington. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Danny Barrington and I'm a senior lecturer in global health in the School of Population and Global Health at the University of Western Australia. I'm presenting here with my colleague, Dr. Amita Bakta, who is the RWSN Leave No One Behind co-lead and is also an independent WASH consultant. So firstly, I wanted to acknowledge that the land that I live, work and play on is that of the Noongar people and that I pay my respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. So what Amita and I are going to do very briefly in our presentation is set the scene about incontinence in low and middle income countries, what it is that we know, and giving some very brief examples from our own work before you'll hear some more in-depth findings from a couple of our colleagues. We thought we'd start off with explaining what we mean when we talk about incontinence. It's a medical term and it explains an involuntary loss of urine and feces. Uh, but beyond that, there's actually different types of incontinence as well. So urge urinary incontinence is a sudden, unexpected and intense urge to pass urine. Stress incontinence is the involuntary passing of urine when people cough or sneeze or engage in some sort of physical activity like exercise. Urge fecal incontinence is when an individual is aware that they need to pass feces but doesn't make it to the toilet in time. Passive fecal incontinence is when people are unaware that they're passing feces. And people can experience overflow incontinence when watery stools leak out because they can't empty their bowels properly. And then this third group of incontinence types that people don't uh, often know about is social or functional incontinence. And that's when a person leaks urine or feces because they can't reach a toilet in time. So this can be due to mobility issues or inaccessibility or just not wanting to use the toileting facilities that are offered them. So you might experience incontinence. The answer is everybody. Often we think about incontinence as being something that happens to older people, perhaps women who've recently given birth but it's actually a much more common experience than most of us realize. So you can have a look at this diagram in the reference that we've got on our last slide. It's probably being shared now in the chat box. But women who are pregnant or have given birth or are going through the menopause transition or even who are menopausal are often experiencing incontinence. And a particular subgroup of these are women who've experienced obstetric fistula, which is when Essentially, the baby gets stuck during childbirth and a hole tears between either the bladder and the vagina or the bowel and the vagina and urine and feces leak out of the vagina, which can happen essentially constantly throughout the day for these women. People with a range of physical and mental disabilities also often experience incontinence. So things like dementia, cancer, uh, neurological conditions and also victims of assault. People in highly stressful situations can experience incontinence. So there is actually some evidence to suggest that children in humanitarian settings, particularly in armed conflict, are reverting to wetting the bed again at night, which they didn't do before they're in such a stressful situation. And then, as I mentioned on the last slide, there's also people who don't want to use the wash facilities on offer, who might self-wet uh, in their clothes or in their bed, that kind of thing. I guess the next thing is, well, why should we care that people are having these experiences? And there can be lots of negative impacts on people's lives on a daily basis. So we've kind of got four arenas that this happens in. 
firstly around health conditions, so things like skin conditions, infections and rashes, and urinary tract infections. In addition, people who have urinary incontinence often dehydrate themselves on purpose so that they can avoid having accidents. And then beyond that, people who are rushing to the toilet and have that mobility may actually have other accidents due to that on their way to a toileting facility. People who experience incontinence can also feel ashamed, they can be bullied, and they might choose, or they might actually not be allowed, to engage in various normal or social activities in their day-to-day -day lives. It can be quite expensive to experience incontinence in terms of buying things, not just traditional things we might think of like pads or mattress protectors, but also things that enable them to be able to wash themselves, their bedding and their clothes. So an increased water allowance, which is really where the link to rural water supply comes in, having access to extra soap, and then also having somewhere to dispose of these soiled items. Incontinence can also mean that people aren't able to work or they're not able to work as productively as they might otherwise, and that can then impact on their, their income or ability to earn in income. And then finally, there's actually a protection side to incontinence, it's often forgotten about. And that's that people with incontinence are often abused by other people, and sometimes they're also punished, for example, by their caregivers. And that brings us to an example of a project that I've been working on the last few years. So we were working with children aged five to 11 who self-wet. So we were mostly just focusing on urinary incontinence, or at least we were talking about urine as the thing that is leaked. And we were working with children in the Cox's Bazaar refugee camps in Bangladesh and uh, children in the refugee settlements in northern Uganda in Ajimani district. And as well as working with the children, uh, we also interviewed their caregivers and give, did a sanitary survey. So this photograph here is a picture that one of the children drew drew during a storybook session and the words written beneath that are um, what the facilitators uh, wrote after having the picture explained to them by the child. So what we found was that a lot of children self-wet and they're often teased by their peers and punished by parents and teachers for the fact that they are wetting particularly the bed or their clothes. But we also found that most of these children who are self-wetting don't have the medical condition of incontinence. It's actually that they don't want to use the sanitation facilities on offer. And that might be because they're very far away or they're worried about what might happen to them on the way to these facilities or because they're not satisfied with the toilets that are on offer when they actually do get to those facilities. Or they're just, again, scared of what might happen in these facilities where there might not be adequate lighting, there may be adults around that they don't know. I'm going to hand over now to my co-presenter, Anita. I thought they were extending being part of a project to make sure that older people and we recently put older people who have been displaced by cycling in different parts of Malawi and by war in Ethiopia. We found that lots of older people experience incontinence. Many cannot leave their homes and feel isolated, depressed, and even suicidal. This special percentage in community in reality shows how much it is inaccessible for older people in the camps. Access to water is charity because the water points were too far away from their homes and they and their families did not have the containers needed to collect water. So how can we help? Well, firstly, we can begin by the provision of extra incontinence products. So, incontinence aids such as pads and nappies, cousins, mattress protectors, and extra bedding. The other key thing we can do is bring the silence. We need to normalize incontinence as part of the conversation. 
Thank you again for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Danny, as well as uh, Amita. That was quite an informative presentation. Um, apparently, Mohammed, 77 year old uh, from Africa, he hasn't mentioned his country. He indicated that he's hoping to hear some recommendations as well as some action uh, areas. So I'm very excited with what you have been able to provide. I hope you are learning Mohammed and listening and following in uh, kindly. Uh, we are seeing representation from, I think, all over the world. I can see Japan, I can see Finland. I have seen uh, Kenya, I've seen Uganda, Mali, Liberia, um, and this this is quite uh, this is quite uh, exciting uh, participants. So kindly, we are requesting that you continue sending in your views, continue sending in your questions uh, in the chat box, and we are going to be able to share them in the end of the presentation sessions. Um, I want to welcome next Shapara Nawaz. She's a research trainee, and she's going to take us through the next uh, session. Thank you so much, uh, Shapara. Welcome. Hello everyone, I am Shahapra Nawaz. I'm working as a research trainee at ICDRB. Today I will talk about how climate hazards impact the water needs of people with disabilities experiencing incontinence in Bangladesh. We found these impacts through a collaborative study done by ICDRB, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and World Vision. The study focused on inclusive climate resilient wash in Bangladesh and was funded by Water for Women. Bangladesh is recognized as a highly climate vulnerable country as frequent intense climate hazards are striking the country several times every year. 90 million people of the country live in high climate exposure areas. When categorized according to region, the northern region experiences severe flood everywhere tropical cyclone hits southern coastal region every year. These climate hazards damages water sanitation and hygiene facilities also. Now, a recent nationwide population-based survey revealed that 8% of the total population of Bangladesh has disability. 21% of the survey participants reported having urine leakage issues with a higher prevalence among those with disabilities compared to those without. Around 8% of the individual experienced fecal incontinence, where fecal incontinence was more prevalent among people with disabilities compared to those without disabilities. So what was the aim of our study? We wanted to strengthen evidence about how climate hazards affect the health and well-being of people with disabilities through risk to wash. But we also explored how climate hazards impacted the wash experiences of people with disabilities living with incontinence in rural areas of Bangladesh. We conducted an in-depth qualitative assessment in Gaibandha and Shakhira. Gaibandha is a northern district that experiences severe flooding every year and Shakhira is a southern coastal district that experiences tropical cyclones every year. We purposively selected 39 people with disabilities and 16 caregivers who reported of experiencing cyclone or flood within last five years. These are the data collection methods. We did in-depth interviews, observation, accessibility and safety audit, photo voice and ranking. We did a thematic analysis after coding, summarizing and data triangulation. So what did these climate hazards do to wash facilities? In Shakira, all the participants remembered Cyclone Amphan from 2020 that destroyed their houses and toilet facilities. The picture at the upper right hand part shows how Cyclone Amphan caused destruction in Shapkira. All the participants, people with disabilities, experiencing incontinence and their caregivers from Gaibantha reported of experiencing floods within last five years. 
which flooded their houses, tubers, and toilets. The picture at the lower right corner shows how intense the flood was for people living in Gaibandha at 2021. These climate hazards and the damages caused by those raised major challenges for people with disabilities living with incontinence and their caregivers. The tubal became inaccessible as the paths were damaged or the tubal itself were flooded. The toilet facilities were damaged, broke or flooded. The bathing and laundry facilities also became inaccessible amidst cyclone and flood. Regarding water quantity, as the tubers become inaccessible, collecting drinking water in adequate quantity became very difficult. Moving through the damaged muddy waterlogged paths caused injury by slipping and falling to many study participants. Water shortage for cleaning after toileting, bathing and laundry was reported by many people with disability experiencing incontinence and their caregivers as reaching the water point was a great struggle for them. The water points also became inaccessible and many did not have stored adequate water. Therefore, they could not clean or wash their body or soiled clothes even when they required it urgently when people living with incontinence could not hold back the urge of urination and defecation anymore. Here are the lived experiences of Shuprava Sharkar and her daughter during Cyclone Ampan in Shatkhira about the challenges they faced due to water point inaccessibility and water shortage. These photos were taken during photo voice and ranking, were directed by Shuprava herself and her is owned by Shuprava. Shuprava's daughter has mobility, communication, self-care, and cognitive disabilities. She is living with incontinence also, and her mother provides her wash supports as her caregiver. Through the photo at the left, where the bucket, towels, mugs, and clothes are shown, Shuprava wanted to tell about the water shortage for bathing her daughter, though her daughter needed regularly to maintain her personal hygiene. She said, I had to bath my daughter during the Amphan with the little water I collected from the rainfall because I did not have water in my house. The photo of the right is showing the pot her daughter defecated in, in which Shuprava cleans. But during Amphan, she did not have enough water to clean it as they could not reach the water point and did not have enough water at home. She said, cleaning the pot that she defecates in was harder during Cyclone Amphan because we didn't have enough water to wash and clean. There was also a risk of coming in contact with urine and feces. To manage these challenges regarding their water needs, people with disabilities living with incontinence and their caregivers applied some coping strategies. They limited their food and water consumption so that they can restrict or limit the urge of urination and defecation and they do not need to use toilets frequently. And even though they are required bathing regularly to keep their personal hygiene, and keep their body clean after using toileting, they avoided regular bathing, bathing due to water shortage. Water shortage also led them to keep their soiled clothing and bedding inside their house without washing during cyclone and flood. And those who could not keep those clothes and bedding in house anymore, they were compelled to use feces contaminated flood water to wash those. Asiya, this is a pseudonym. Uh, we have received this quote from in-depth interviews. Asiya is a mother of a man with intellectual and communication disability. She said, he urinates and defecates in clothes and can control it. I clean his soiled clothes during flood. I used flood water to wash those clothes. These challenges and coping strategies impacted health and well-being of people with disability experiencing incontinence. People living with incontinence came into contact with urine and feces frequently during flood and cyclone as they could not clean themselves properly after toileting. They could not take regular baths and they could not wash soil, clothes and bedding whenever needed. This increased their risk of contracting infectious diseases. Their dependency on the caregiver also increased as they could not collect water themselves and they had to use the water that the caregivers brought from alternative sources during emergency times. And also they had to wait till their caregivers helped them to clean and wash themselves during cyclone and flood. Some of them also complained of skin issues. There were adverse impacts on the lives of caregivers also, as they had to clean the buckets, pots where their care recipients urinated and defecated, wash soil, clothes and bedding, or help handle them to clean later. They also came into contact with urine and feces. Their water collection, toileting support, and washing and cleaning tasks increased during the unusual situation created by disasters. And washing, cleaning all those soil, clothes, bedding, and defecation pots with bare hand also induced feeling of disgust among them. Akkas is a man with communication and mobility disability. Akkas's mother said, he defecated in the room while he was hurrying to go into the toilet. Then I covered the stool with some clothes for the night and I threw it after the storm had stopped the next morning. I got water in the bucket and threw water on him. 
This quote reveals how Akkas had to wait whole night without cleaning his body after defecating during Cyclone Amphan and had to keep his stool soiled cloth in the house with him and his caregiver, which made both of them come into contact with urine and feces. Then, Alia. Alia is a woman with mobility, communication, and cognitive disabilities. Alia's mother said, I washed the soil clothes in the flood water during that time. I washed my hands with soap. Still, I did not feel like eating anything after washing the clothes. I felt disgusted to eat food with those hands. Alia's mother's quotes indicated how this cleaning and washing tasks can create a feeling of disgust among caregivers. So, what did we understand from this finding? We understood that as majority of the water sources, toilet and hygiene facilities were damaged and this intensified difficulties regarding cleaning after toilet and bathing and laundry for people with disabilities during cyclone and flood. Therefore, their water need for practicing personal hygiene increased. People with disabilities experiencing incontinence and their caregivers had a greater risk of contracting infectious disease which can adversely impact their quality of life. And there was no mention of any disaster preparedness for incontinence man management of people with disabilities. No preparedness activities were known to the caregivers also. And there was very limited knowledge about incontinence products, which increased the wash related tasks of the caregivers and uh, dependency of people with disabilities on their caregivers for keeping their personal hygiene. So, what are the recommendations we can give to improve the health and well being of people with disabilities experiencing incontinence during climate hazards? We need to support them by providing incontinence products. And also, we need to support the caregivers about how to maintain personal hygiene of their care recipients during emergency times. We need to support people with disabilities experiencing incontinence and their family members to form a disaster preparation checklist and evacuation packs so they can handle the disasters themselves. We should also expand tailor options with consideration of the disability type that could improve health and well being of people with disabilities during climate hazards. When distributing tailored wash packs, we should also input incontinence products in them. And we have to ensure that all over, the participation of people with disabilities experiencing incontinence and their caregivers are ensured throughout developing and implementing all kinds of solutions that can manage their incontinence during emergency times like cyclone and flood. Thank you so much for listening. I will be very glad to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tapara. That was quite an interesting. That, that was quite an interesting as well as informative uh, presentation. From me, what I'm getting from your whole conversation is uh, basic things, you know, like inclusive design on wash facilities. Besides that, it's not just about accessing any type of water. There was flood water, but then at the same time, we're looking at the quality of water. We are looking at the accessibility of water. We're looking at the quantities that are also available to uh, be able to help uh, people with incontinence issues. At the same time, um, one quick question that I've been having during your presentation was, we need to, we need to, we need to. But I'm wondering, who is we? So probably you can be able to answer that uh, by the end uh, of, of the session itself as we move into the Q&A session after this presentation from Alison. Thank you so much, Alison. You're welcome. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to join this webinar today, talking about incontinence, an urgent hidden issue for rural water supply. My name is Alison Coleman, and I'm the Disability Inclusion Technical Advisor for World Vision in Vanuatu. So where is Vanuatu, you may well ask? Well, the Republic of Vanuatu is a small island nation located in the South Pacific Ocean almost 2,000 kilometres east of Australia, north of New Zealand, and to the west of Fiji. Vanuatu is home to roughly 300,000 people who live on 83 geographically diverse islands spanning more than 1,000 kilometres towards the Solomon Islands in the north and New Caledonia to the south. Many of the 83 islands are small and remote, and six are home to active volcanoes that cause frequent earthquakes, tidal waves, and toxic ash fall. Many refer to Vanuatu as the happiest place on earth, 
as it was just recently rated by the Happy Planet Index in 2024. However, Vanuatu is also rated as number one by the World Risk Index as being the most disaster prone country in the world and the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. This is evidenced by regular natural disasters such as strong cyclones, droughts, floods, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions that are experienced every single year. So given how frequently people in Vanuatu are experiencing these kind of traumatic natural disasters and how intertwined we know these kinds of high stress events are with incontinence, it would make sense that people in Vanuatu might be finding issues and experiencing incontinence. However, local cultural taboos in Vanuatu mean that people with incontinence often don't tend to talk to anyone about it because of the shame and stigma attached. So that's why in 2019, the team down here at World Vision Vanuatu worked in collaboration with national and international partners, such as the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, to undertake a large scale study to find out more about the experiences of incontinence for people here in Vanuatu. The team visited more than 11,000 households and interviewed more than 56,000 people to find out that approximately one in four or 25% of people without disabilities and one in three or 33% of people with disabilities reported experiencing either urinary or fecal incontinence at least three times a week or more. And of those people experiencing incontinence, 50% or half didn't know of, have access to, or use any products to help manage their leakage. Instead, what we found was that many people with incontinence were having significant limitations placed on their lives. With the most common management strategies reported, as restricting the amount of food and water given to the person with incontinence in order to limit their growth and their need for regular toilet use, as well as keeping them at home and preventing their participation in community life or social activities, further contributing to social isolation and stigma. You can imagine this resulted in people with incontinence having reduced personal autonomy and the ability to participate in activities of their choice, like going to work, going to school, or going to church with their family and friends. And during times of disasters, people with disabilities were twice as likely to be left at home instead of being assisted to evacuate to a safe place such as a community evacuation center because of embarrassment and fear of what others might think. So all of this information brought about the development of the World Vision program, Epic Life. This program aims to empower people with information about personal care and continence using locally made inclusive functional equipment so that people who experience incontinence ha can have reduced feelings of shame and increased knowledge of and access to local affordable products that they can use to help. Now in order to have access to these products, the program worked to create a local supply chain utilising funding from a Global Innovation Challenge Award to train groups of women to make continence management products out of locally available and recycled materials. One of the products is washable and reusable incontinence underwear. It was a new product, something the women had never heard of before. 
But what we did was we took locally available underwear and we sewed in three layers. A waterproof layer made out of recycled bags, an absorbent layer and a wicking layer on top for comfort. We trialled this new underwear with women who reported that they loved how comfortable it was and the confidence they found to do daily tasks when wearing them. The group also made waterproof mattress protectors. These were made out of recycled rice bags with a blanket sewn on top that can be used as a sleeping mat to prevent nighttime leaks. Another product are wash mitts. These are a simple face washer sewn together that you wear on your hand like a glove with soap inside that allows you to independently wash yourself using only a small amount of water. It can also be used in conjunction with the waterproof mattress protector to give someone who is non-mobile a dignified bath in bed. These were found to be particularly useful in those rural areas with limited access to water and privacy for bathing. Locally made portable toilet chairs were also made out of recycled timber pallets that otherwise would have ended up in landfill. These commode style chairs were found to be very useful for those people who experience incontinence and have to walk long distances over uneven or unsafe terrain to access a toilet. We found they could be used inside the home, particularly at night and in times of heavy rain or cyclones. Thus making people with disabilities have increased safety during times of natural disasters. So we found that by increasing access to and use of these simple locally made continence products such as the mattress protector, the continence underwear, the portable toilet chair and the wash mitts, we were able to provide increased independence and dignity with personal care and continence management for people in Vanuatu. During our evaluation of the project, I was so grateful to meet people like Nettie proud grandmother who shared some of her experiences around incontinence with us. Nettie explained that she used to be the main income earner for her family, sewing dresses and selling them in the local marketplace. Like many people in Vanuatu, she developed complications from type 2 diabetes requiring amputation of one of her legs. After the surgery, Nettie explained that she could no longer go to the toilet by herself and she often experienced incontinence. She didn't want to leave her home because she was just too embarrassed. Nettie relied on her granddaughter to care for her, which meant that she needed to stay at home to help with toileting during the day. Nettie was so happy to hear about the locally available products that could help her manage her toileting with much more independence. And she told us, now I don't need my granddaughter to stay at home with me all day. She can go back to school in the mornings while I look after myself. She was so happy to be able to go back to school and be with her friends. So thank you so much to Nettie and the others for sharing their stories with us to help us better understand this important topic that is often hidden away and overlooked when considering the additional wash needs of people with incontinence and their carers. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Alison. Wild Vision is apparently in a hundred county, countries, I guess. So I hope that you can be able to also get more stories from the other 99. Hopefully they're also tackling the issues to do with incontinence and ensuring that we have inclusive rural water access uh, 
for all. So I would like to take, uh, um, I, want, I, I want to welcome Dr. Tina. I'm not going to pronounce her second name because it's a little bit difficult, That's but fine. please <laughs> welcome Dr. Tina. <laughs> and take us through your interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Euphrasia. It's Tina Maitinen from Tampere University. And uh, for the past five years, I've had this project called Pat Project Online, which you can check the website where, where I've been trying to develop a model for holistically sustainable continence care, looking at also, um, also the environmental questions that have to do with incontinence and particularly the fact that we don't talk about incontinence. So, um, um, I just want to thank all the presentations and I want to make clear to all the listeners that you are now, or you were, not now, but you were listening, when you were listening to this uh, presentation, you were actually listening to, to some cutting edge knowledge on uh, WASH, global health, as well as incontinence uh, research. Because these are questions that are not discussed almost anywhere and yet, these are questions that we actually really, really, really need to get on the next sustainable development agenda, because unless we do, we will not have a sustainable future that is fair and just for everybody, but it will also not be environmentally sustainable. So um, I just want to kind of recap some of the things that um, Danny and Amita were discussing in the introduction. So Amita was... Uh, saying how people actually are often hidden because of their incontinence but there's also more to this that not only are people purposely hidden when they live with incontinence but societies and their wash infrastructure throughout the world everywhere actually are such that people have to be kind of hiding in their homes because they cannot operate in the society because our wash infrastructures are built in a way that they are not accessible for people who live with incontinence. So it's easier to stay at home, even if you were able to move. Um, then um, Danny, and uh, I, I love the picture that Danny was showing of how incontinence is is much broader issue that we often tend to talk about. Uh, it really, um, yes, it affects fewer people than communicable diseases, Maybe, but then if we think about also the impacts on on carers, for instance, it actually impacts a lot more people that we might think. Ten to ten percent of all women um, and thirty percent of women uh, over fifty years old live with live with urinary incontinence. Who for people who live in the communities and then people who live in care settings, that's even more. Uh, among men, for uh, five to thirty two percent of men, depending on age, live with urinary incontinence. Fecal incontinence affects 8 to 9% of community dwelling adults, regardless of gender. And these prevalence figures tend to be very sort of based on research on high income countries and high income settings. Um, so this is also to emphasize why this webinar was giving you really some cutting edge uh, knowledge on these issues that are not spoken about, not in WASH uh, field, not in global health field, but also not in the, in the arenas where incontinence is discussed either. So yeah, take all the knowledge that you can kind of and, and cherish your notes and take them back to your to your day to day jobs. I was looking at the list of participants and we have some really, really uh, wonderful audience here today as well. Um, so my point about this knowledge having to be accounted for in the next sustainable development goal, I want to emphasize that this is not only the social burden and on the individuals and their carers, but it also actually has massive both economic and eco ecological impacts on society. So um, I'm just going to give an example from Europe because this kind of research hasn't been done in, in other um, or has usually been done in high income settings. But just the recent report by uh, European Association for, for Urology uh, to, says that uh, the economic impact of, of urinary incontinence alone, not accounting for fecal incontinence, accounts for uh, two thirds of the same cost as cancer uh, economically. So the costs are immense and the costs are immense in, and also already in the pre presentations, like Alison was say, telling how, how carers, like young carers cannot go to school because they care of their um, 
uh, their family members who live within continents. So these kind of multiple multiple impacts on on the economy in each society need to be accounted for, and the environmental impacts are massive as well. Uh, uh, reuse, um, single use incontinence pads make uh, several percent of municipal waste throughout the world, and of course, in in societies where water infrastructure is not. Uh, uh, very well develop, developed or there are like illegal dumps that also has like then persons with money <laughs> you can use single use products and then those uh, who live in slums for instance actually have can, can feel that environmental impact and of course then we heard like uh, I like in Alison's presentation that when the global production chains are not even available that people have, don't have access to these products or knowledge of these products either so there is a um, interplay between like the environmental burden of single-use products versus uh, uh, versus actually having the privilege of of having quality products, and I want to therefore start with Alison's uh, presentation, kind of just also emphasizing. I really love this project; it is it is epic by its name. Um, and not only does uh, this World Vision project does it, does it give the example of of how it is possible to provide quality products sustainably and sort of community produced, but it also, I think it gives an example that we need to count that we can learn from in all societies, because the fact is that all kinds of single use health technologies uh, pose a massive threat to planetary boundaries. And we cannot, we, there, there are, will not, there are actually not enough uh, uh, raw materials to extract for these, for also for uh, in the future, also for the products that we are used for care. So this kind of example where you where you actually um, where communities themselves produce are um, the continents products that are of good quality and people love to use and also of raw materials that are locally produced. It's a, it's a really really wonderful example and and goes well beyond the case of of Vanuatu uh, and the well beyond the case of rural wash. Uh, wash issues um, because uh, we can all imagine the waste burden that comes from single use adult incontinence pads. We can kind of see that, visualize that, but actually of the environmental burden, that waste burden uh, accounts for only 10 to 40% of the overall environmental impact and 60 to 90% of the overall environmental impact of these products comes from extraction of raw materials and the global production change, which is often forgotten. So these kinds of examples are just kind of really mind blowing and something that need to be accounted for when we think about sustainable futures, socially, economically, and ecologically sustainable futures. And then also Shapara's um, presentation, I just, absolutely very, very like hugely important uh, research, um, given how uh, how much different kinds of disasters will actually increase because of the climate change at the moment, and then showing how disaster preparedness is actually completely non-inclusive. I think that's um, looking at incontinence and how it is accounted for in disaster preparedness is something that we need to do in all sectors and and in all societies again um it does raise the question on on who is disaster preparedness strategy who are they made for uh, what is the norm of a person that we imagine and i i'm saying what i want to everybody to understand that the norm of a person we need to think about is a person who have bladders blad who have a bladder and bowel and whose i mean continents so the function of bladders and bowels actually orchestrates the lives of every single person who has ever lived on this planet and who will ever live on this planet and they don't always function perfectly and they particularly don't function perfectly when you are uh, in some kind of a humanitarian situation so therefore it is crucially important as Shapara's presentation shows that disaster preparedness and all kinds of humanitarian action are taught through through questions of continents and different kinds of continents and capacities, because really urination and defecation is something that applies to every single person every single day. So if we kind of refuse to talk about that, we will not be able to build sustainable society, sustainable um, humanitarian action, sustainable um, developer co cooperation, sustainable wash, um, 
And uh, it's 2024, it's perfectly fine that we talk, start recognizing that people have bladders and bowels and everybody defecates and urinates. And some often throughout our lifetimes, lifetime, we cannot, it's not a matter of voluntary voiding. So I think I want to end here because there are a lot of really, really, really good questions and a wonderful audience. So I'm going to hand over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tina. I will be coming back to you because uh, we're having a lot of questions around uh, issues to do with awareness. But at the moment, I'd like to speak to Shapara as we welcome uh, the session on uh, questions. So kindly put on all your videos, speakers. Danny, Amita, Alison, Shapara. I hope your videos are on. I hope your mics are unmuted. So first and foremost, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. And it has been quite informative. This is an issue that is quite new to many people. And we're getting a lot of fast and information uh, from experts like you. And thank you also for people who are also sharing their research agenda. We really need evidence as well to be able to get that knowledge uh, in, in detail. So I'll go to Shapara. As I mentioned on the research and providing evidence and also uh, giving us quite some information as well as innovations in the humanitarian and, and uh, emergency response um, uh, uh, sector, I would like to hear from you on the issue of what can the community do? Somebody has been able to, uh, to ask uh, the same on the chat box. What can the community do to make incontinence to be more, uh, managing incontinence to be more inclusive? Uh, secondly, um, I would also want to inquire from you on the issue to do uh, with um, also the government itself in terms of decision makers and the likes. We are seeing a lot of good work going on with governments giving medical cover uh, to all people. We are also seeing them coming up uh, with various products like the pension itself, but beyond the pension, what can the government do to ensure that WASH is more inclusive to also the people who are facing um, incontinence as well as uh, disability issues? And I think I would like to combine that into one question with regards to what can other people do? Like who should be doing what uh, with regards to addressing incontinence issues? So that we're not just having a conversation, but in the end of it all, we can be able to know who can be accountable with regards to pushing the agenda forward. Then um, besides that, uh, there's also one more question from Brian Reed uh, to you as well, uh, Shapara. He's asking, do you have any hints on the safe emptying and cleaning of commodores or uh, potties? Same for the laundry of soiled underwear. Thank you. Shapara, over to you. Hi, thank you so much for your question. I hope you can hear me, right? Okay. So as you have seen, I think I have mentioned in the presentations also that commuters itself, uh, specifically as we are focusing on the rural areas, are not yet that much prepared to manage incontinence properly when there is an emergency situation, like a cyclone or a flood. Uh, because I'm uh, telling from my experience, and when I have been to the rural areas, which has been affected by this kind of uh, disasters, they don't uh, actually prioritize uh, doing something for wash preparedness or incontinence management at that time. They prioritize on survival, mostly. They try to protect their livelihoods. They try to manage for food, fuel. So even uh, about the knowledge about the incontinence products and incontinence products, for the rural community, they have very limited knowledge about the incontinence product. And also they are, I, I haven't known any area of uh, where I have been uh, in rural areas of Bangladesh where the incontinence products are available in sufficient amount. So as you all, in all the wonderful presentations, uh, you have mentioned about incontinence products also, but those are not really known to people. So community do prepare 
to, uh, for the disasters, for the emergency situation, and their focus is on saving their livelihoods, saving for food. Some visit to shelters, which are also not accessible for people with disabilities or older people. And those shelters also focus on storing of food, maybe water, and saving the livelihoods. But preparing for water sanitation and hygiene products and preparing for incontinent management is not a prioritized issue yet in the rural communities. And for the what is government doing to make uh, every uh, the interventions or the policies more inclusive? So in the context of Bangladesh, I can say Bangladesh is a, a lower middle income country. So in the context of Bangladesh, yes, the need of people with disabilities and older people are being addressed in the policies right now. There are policies which are being made to include people with disabilities, make the public water sanitation hygiene facilities more accessible. But the implementation has not been that much widespread yet. And even if, for example, if there is a public toilet, public sanitation facilities, and we are making it accessible. Maybe, uh, for example, we think uh, we are making it wheelchair accessible. The government is trying to make the infrastructure wheelchair accessible. But is there any uh, facilities or anything there to, for someone who is uh, having incontinence, for some, to help someone in the public place uh, who is experiencing incontinence? No, it's not. So yes, the uh, uh, need, need of people with disabilities regarding water sanitation hygiene are, are recognized now by our government and they are trying to incorporate their own policies, but yet we uh, have to go a long way to implement that in the from public place to household level to individual level. Even making the incontinence product available and of course affordable for people living in rural areas specifically. For urban areas, maybe there are pharmacies, there are medical centers where incontinence products are available, like diapers for old, uh, older people, adult diapers, uh, back pens, like those. But even in rural areas, it's very, very difficult to find this kind of incontinence product. And it's very, very difficult, even if, uh, someone somewhere it is available. It is it will not be affordable for people to avail this. The cost is really really high. So uh -huh. government is trying to incorporate all of those uh inclusive uh pe inclusive people with you include people with disabilities, but still about the affordability and uh, availability of incontinence product. Mm -hmm. People with disabilities or people without disabilities who are experiencing incontinence still is a long way to go. And I remember that Sashia asked a question that who are we? That we asked who are we? Who should who should we be included? I think as we know that in con better management in of incontinence, this is a cross-sectoral issue. We need to input everyone. First of all, we need to generate evidence that people who are living with incontinence, they are having challenges in normal days, in emergency situation. So who can generate evidence? The researcher, the public health researchers, the wash researcher, the wash experts, the people who are working in the wash sectors, even the uh, who are doing humanitarian response, they can also generate evidence for them. And when we have evidence, when we have awareness about that, the incontinence can be an issue, a very challenging issue for people, then we can pr produce this evidence and give it to the, to the policymakers and implementers because they have so much more engagement. They need to have that focus on these kinds of issues and we need to provide them very solid evidence on that. Look, you have to look into these issues right now. You are telling that we need to make everything inclusive. We need to make wash inclusive. Then you need to also focus on incontinence because incontinence is also a part of water sanitation and hygiene. People living with incontinence, they also need to maintain their personal hygiene with privacy and dignity. And they need water for it. They need a proper sanitation facilities for it. And we need to generate their evidence and also bring up the experiences of people living with incontinence. And then we can bring that to the government people, government people uh, who are policymakers, who are implementers, who are working with the collaboration with the government, humanitarian responses. So this is, we means 
academicians, researchers, wash experts who are doing humanitarian response, who NGOs, everybody. And I think that this webinar, like this webinar, we if we do these kinds of things, we can bring, we can actually make a platform like this where we can incorporate people from every sector, and then we can bring up these issues. Thank you. Thank I you. hope I Thank could you. answer your questions. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. You have done so very well, uh, Shapara. Uh, it's very important for us to continue having evidence because also from the governor's perspective on water agenda, we need evidence-based uh, policies. And it's from the evidence-based policies that we can now be able to uh, support the governments to allocate effective budgets uh, to support um, uh, people who are going through incontinence. So thank you so much for that. I think also the issue of affordability from my view is also coming from the perspective that uh, we are looking at incontinence also from the menstrual health and management uh, perspective. And at the same time, we can see adoption of a lot of market-based approaches coming in on uh, sanitary products. And at the same time, it's not about putting the cost too high and making a profit uh, from such um, products, probably we also need to research more on how we can make such markets work uh, for the poor more effectively. So thank you so much, Shapara, for that uh, great input. I would like to take my next question to uh, Alison. Alison, I will only give you two minutes uh, to be able to address it. And this question says, uh, what should be done to integrate incontinence uh, in WASH and other programming more effectively. This comes from Bekalu in Dagne. Um, in the next minute, probably you can answer this in one minute, and on the next minute, uh, Alison, I would like to hear from you. Um, does the incontinence product such as underwear suitable for the people living in hot weather regions or suitable for the people who sweat a lot? Is there any evidence on the same? This is an anonymous attendee uh, inquiring on this. Alison, over to you, please. Alison, your sound, please. Hi, and thanks so much. Yes, absolutely. I think the incontinence underwear is suitable for people in um, hot temperatures. Vanuatu is a very tropical uh, climate, uh, very high temperatures and very high humidity. So um, the underwear is uh, designed to be suitable for the climate here where, uh, yes, people who, who sweat a lot and we also designed the underwear to be um, quick drying in, uh, in the high humidity and the high temperatures here. And I'd just like to say we built on the local experience of a local group of women here called Mama's Life. Um, and they were making uh, products locally in Vanuatu for um, menstrual health and hygiene, as well as incontinence. So um, we were able to learn a lot and um, take the work that they had already uh, achieved working with local women to create these products so that um, the, the, the marketing of the products is through the women themselves. The women making the products are using the products. They're talking about the products to um, their friends. And, and that's the way that people are um, increasing talking about incontinence here in Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers that question. And um, I'm sure I'll give the floor to someone else now. Thank you. <laughs> let me take the let me take the, the, the next question to uh Dr. Danny. Dr. Danny, what I'd like to hear from you uh is more on what should be done to integrating incontinence in wash and other programming. Bekalu uh Dagne is inquiring on the same. Hey, great. Thank you, Frazier. Um, mm -hmm. so I think something that I think we really need to set out from the beginning is that. Most of us who work in water sanitation and hygiene are not medical doctors. Um, incontinence is very multifaceted and there's, there's lots of ways in which people who are experiencing incontinence probably do need support. And although we might be able to flag people's vulnerabilities, it's not our role to, um, to address these things clinically. Um, so I think a lot of the things we can do as water sanitation and hygiene people are things that we should already be thinking about when it comes to equality um, and non-discrimination programs in general anyway. 
Um, so, you know, as we've said in the presentations, it's not just older people. It's not just people with disabilities who experience incontinence. It's across the lifespan. Um, and it's not just women either, it's men as well. So it really is cross-cutting. And we can start by just doing the things that we're already doing with a bit more perhaps consideration of people who might need, might have different needs. So making sure that our toileting facilities are close by to people, that they're easy to use, um, that there's no big um, issues in getting to toileting facilities. That was a big problem we found in Cox's Bazaar was that people might be able to get to a toilet in time, but they're choosing not to go because they can't, they don't want to actually walk that path because of yeah. other safety concerns. Um, making sure that there is going to be enough water for cleaning. Um, and that particularly goes back to someone else's mentioned around disposable pads. So there are lots of reusable options out there, but yes, they need, if not disposable, they need to be cleaned and dried. And we need to be thinking about that as well as cleaning and drying bedding and clothing as well. And also making sure people have the soap for that. So I think it's really, we can make, we can probably be do some really useful stuff just by doing what we do now, but with a bit more of um, being a bit more thoughtful about making sure that everybody that we're targeting is actually going to get access and not just um, going for the overall amount of coverage we possibly can for the lowest hanging fruit. Let's see if we can actually get um, to everybody's needs with the kind of programming we're doing already. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dani. Indeed, we have to be deliberate. And again, I usually say sustainability is infinite. So we have to continue uh, pushing this. It's not just about making the noise, but it's also putting the voice in the noise. And it's been quite impressive to see that every presentation that has been shared today, we have gotten voices from the field informing us on the issue itself on recommendations also, and also the actions that need to be uh, taken in terms of moving forward. Um, and in this regard, information can definitely never be enough. Creating awareness can never be enough. Dr. Tina, uh, this question is coming to you. And with regards to information, uh, I, I can see so many people indicating in the chat box that this session has been quite informative for them. They're getting a lot of information and uh, again, like they're getting more aware of mm -hmm. issues to do with incontinence better. And this is also going to be able to help a lot of people to manage discrimination, humiliation that comes with um, the incontinence issue itself. And in this regard, we have a very interesting listener today. Uh, Mohammed is saying that he is listening and following this presentation with not only himself, but also his son, who is 11 years old, and also a caregiver of the son uh, who's having um, autism issues. And I'm just wondering, Dr. Tina, about how we can be able to make information more accessible to all, given the interesting background that we had uh, on, 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 on the call itself that you have on your presentation. Uh, it's it's a quite an interesting animation and it's easy for kids like uh, mm -hmm. Mohammed's son to be able to relate to the situation better. Now, uh, from Fikri, he's asking that an outstanding issue right now um, bothering uh, let me try to reread it again because it's not quite clear. He's saying that apparently an outstanding issue right now bothering the incontinence agenda uh, is not more of failure with regards to resource base, but also awareness and knowledge to do uh, in a to do it in a healthy and better way. So really, uh, Fikre is affirming this agenda on awareness, and I would just like to hear your views uh, on the same. How can we enhance? knowledge management, knowledge development, knowledge sharing on issues to do with incontinence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really good questions. And I think uh, on the first one on, on how to increase awareness among or among people with different kinds of um, uh, cognitive um, functions, um, I want to recommend definitely Danny and Amita's work. I think Danny's work with, with children, they have they have uh, produced some, and I think Danny can probably put links to them, some really good infographics, drawings on on uh, on uh, incontinence issues that are highly, highly uh, usable. Um, and, and yes, I do think that one of the ways in which we can 
break the taboo and break the stigma. I mean, we need research, but then we need various different kinds of, of ways to disseminate uh, knowledge. What we did this spring, we made um, a theater show where the pads were on stage and they were talking. And that actually was a very, if, and that was, and the, and the play was written on the basis of materials that we had collected from people who live with incontinence. And for that, that sort of, uh, that, that data collection, I was kind of expecting that we get a lot of stories from people who are, have, you know, have um, postpartum incontinence caused by childbirth. But actually, the biggest group of people who have participated in my research have been working age men. Men's incon if, if incontinence is a taboo, men's incontinence in all societies even more so because, of course, men's bodies are supposed to be in control of themselves throughout their life. So there are layers and layers of stigmas and taboos and whatever the means we can think of making this issue speakable, because then you also end up finding that when you start talking about people really want to talk. Everybody have experiences of either about themselves or care, taking care of their family members or different kinds of questions. And also um, in those discussions, people have a lot of solutions. So I think the first thing we need to do is to start talking. And I, I, I would actually, I think it would be a silver bullet to get continence health on the next sustainable development goals, because that would force every single sector in society to talk about continents. Um, so that if we could do, if we could have a campaign on that, I think that would be, could be very, very powerful and also accounting for like different kinds of continents needs. Um, so um, what was the second question that had to do with, was it still about awareness or was yes. it on the, yes. Yes, so, still on so I think I did, did respond to, to that as well maybe but just kind of keep on talking keep on raising the the issue i think that's that's the first thing that we, we really need to do and then because having somehow to the if we could get these conversations somehow on the high level of of uh, of public health and and wash talks um and the next sustainable development goals would really be that that place um and and maybe working to get i know like sort of menstrual health is kind of kind of working in parallel to each other so kind of when, when it's strategically uh and or like what danny is doing for instance and what amida is doing uh when it's strategically uh good i think we need to join forces talk about bodily leakages because human bodies leak it's a fact and it is an issue of various dimensions yeah good. Uh yeah, we are we are actually having that we're going to have a stronger voice when we are together. Yeah. And information is definitely power. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, um, uh, Dr. Dr. Tina. Now, um, I would also like to mention the fact that also spaces and networks like our RWSN are also providing, are also curating such knowledge and also providing a space for people to be able to have, to push the conversations even further. You can do that through our LNOB uh, group and you can also be able to join the network itself from the link that Aline is going to be providing on the chat box itself. You can also share it with your other colleagues so that they can continue having more information on the uh, concept itself. Now, moving to the issue of affordability versus availability. Alison, I'm coming back to you. There's a question that is being uh, inquired here by two uh, followers. They are indicating Sorry, uh, here you go. They are inquiring, does the incontinence product such as underwear suitable for the people living? Oh, sorry, I had already asked that. Goodness. I'm not sure if I mentioned the second part of your question, which was, is there an evaluation? And yes, it's currently being evaluated at the moment. So watch this space and hopefully that will be published before the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you. And still back to the question itself, so many are trickling in, so sorry for the confusion. Um, here goes one, if the costs are very expensive, what else are the best solutions uh, to getting products itself? And then at the same time, they're also wondering about the reusable products. Uh, how, how are the costs compared to menstrual hygiene products? This is coming from Tara Batik and Alu Badara. Over to you, Alison. 
Thank you. Great question. And yes, um, absolutely. The cost of incontinence products are significantly higher than the costs of uh, menstrual products. And mm -hmm. I think um, obviously driven by demand um, uh, in that there every many people are using menstrual health products and the uh, lack of awareness of um, incontinence products is a big barrier. So um, forums like this, where we're raising awareness of the fact that there are reusable incontinence products that are available and um, can be locally made or locally accessed are gonna help drive production of incontinence products. And hopefully that will bring down the price because currently that is a barrier that prevents mm -hmm. people from uh, being able to use both disposable and reusable incontinence products. So that was one of our driving factors to make incontinence products more affordable in the local context. Okay, thank you so much. Shapara, how can we address this issue in WASH policy and strategies better? Uh, can anyone mention a few issues with incontinence that can be stated in these documents? Shapara, please. Could you be the person to mention some of these issues that should be mentioned in policies and strategies to do with incontinence? This is coming from AKM Ibrahim. Hey, yes, uh, I can do that, but uh, I will give example from the disaster perspective. Uh, that uh, Bangladesh, for Bangladesh is focusing a lot on disaster response, disaster management, disaster recovery. So. When uh, we have many policies, many actors, because we are a disaster prone country, we really frequently get hit by cyclone. Recently, we also got hit by a cyclone. So we have cyclone and flood. So when we are addressing the disasters issue, responding to disasters, managing the disaster, how about we include incontinence management also in that? We, when we are giving the wash package, to uh, uh to the families who are disaster struck, who are cyclone struck or flood struck, then how about we also include some uh, locally made incontinence product in those? Just even just to use it for the emergency situation. Maybe that uh, incontinence product is not fully suitable for the person who is living with incontinence, but for at that moment he or she will have something to manage the incontinence. If we can give them uh, a, some uh, locally available incontinence product with the wash package. So we need to include different wings of the government sectors, like wash wing, policy support branch, and disaster management wing, relief wing. We can do that like for us researchers, when we do disseminations of our research outputs, we include different government stakeholders and we include them in our workshops, in participatory workshops. We can include the people living with incontinence who wants to talk about it, who wants to share their challenging experience. And also we can bring the government stakeholders there and let them have a dialogue so that they can include this kind of issues there. I think thank this you. can be a possible situation. Thank you, Shapara. I just wanted to hear from you what exactly should be put in the policy document in just 15 seconds, please. Uh, in, including incontinence along with mm -hmm. wash, not thinking it separately, in hygiene maintenance, in water sanitation, including incontinence issue, issue addressing mm -hmm. incontinence issue, incorporating it in, in wash management or uh, wash policies. Okay, okay then. Coming back to you, um, Danny. Usman Khan Ahbadi wants to know how do age, uh, gender and underlying health conditions contribute to the development of incontinence and what diagnostic tests are typically used to evaluate and diagnose incontinence? Two minutes, please. Hi, it's a big one for two minutes. <laughs> I guess all I can say really is that incontinence is a symptom of a heap of different things. So um, as I said in the um, in my presentation, mm -hmm. you have fecal and urinary incontinence, and then you also have um, social incontinence where it's, you know people can't actually get to the bathroom. And sometimes people, um, it's not actually about there being a physical issue. It's um, more mm -hmm. that they aren't able to get what they need. Um, and I mean, we know that childbirth uh, is a big contributor to incontinence, as is the menopause and, and going uh, the menopause transition, um, all sorts of cancer, 
and various other um, illnesses, really. So I, it's hard to really speak quickly for that one. Um, so yeah. what was the second part of the question? Well, about diagnostic tests. Um, yeah, so in terms yeah. of actual diagnostic tests, I mean, they're done in the clinical setting. Um, mm -hmm. I can see that Alison has shared a short form, actually, in their questions called the um, Incontinence Impact Questionnaire Short Form, um, which is another way that you can... Uh, you can measure the impact of incontinence on people's everyday life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're not in the uh, habit of diagnosing people. As I said, we're not medical doctors. We can look at how it's impacting on people's lives, but to get a diagnosis, that really needs to be done in a clinical mm -hmm. setting. Help. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to really appreciate uh, all the presenters uh, for the amazing work that they've been able to do in terms of sharing with us all that knowledge. Uh, most of us are indicating that apparently we had no clue of even what incontinence was uh, from the chat um, input. Uh, and I believe you're leaving this session today being more informed. And in that regard, I'd just like to also invite you again uh, to join the RWSN network. Uh, we have a link that is already provided on the chat boxes. At the same time, continue being the advocate of issues to do with incontinence as we have been challenged by Alison herself. I mean, we, we should be the change that we want to be able to see. So thank you so much um, for being active listeners as well. And also thank you so much for your active uh, participation. Uh, from here, I'd like to hand over the next session to um, Dr. Amita. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, all of the that you think we have a wide variety of positions, and these positions cover a wide range of age groups from children to older people. I think it's important to know that that incontinence can affect everyone of all ages and genders, and that we thought that we need to talk about it more openly and more clearly um, within the bus and beyond. So, um, although I want to say thank you for coming today, um, we've shared some resources in the chat box we can give you more information on what had to help. I guess now the focus is to start talking more about leaks, start talking more about content and move forward with programming and include people living with content as part of what programming and we'll Thank you.